Hello, I'm Kate Langbrook, and um, we're doing a live about my book, Ciao Bella, and I am here to um, answer your questions or make conversation. My book is about um, the two years that my family and I um, spent living in Italy. We moved to Italy from Australia in 2019. Uh, there's six of us in the family. Um, and we had 2019 and then um, a thing called COVID happened in 2020. So our grand adventure took a kind of unexpected turn. Um, hello, Wendy. Um, so feel free to ask me a question and I will answer it um, to the best of my ability. And uh, otherwise, I will tell you a little bit about Char Bella that, um, as I said, is the book about having a grand adventure. And um, I guess it's also a book about falling in love and um, an unexpected kind of falling in love with a country, which I guess all falling in love is kind of unexpected, isn't it? But um, hello, Mary. Hello, Better Reading. Are you talking to me? I think you, you're you probably um, talking to, to um, people in the comments. Um, anyway, so in um, hello, Karen. Good evening. Very good manners. Readers have got very good manners. Elizabeth, do you believe what is happening in Victoria at the moment, the country that you once loved. Well, that's slightly off topic, isn't it? But it is interesting. I think that's probably the subject for another conversation at another time. But it certainly is strange times. Hello, Sharon, Tracy, Susan, Mary. Amazing you have written a book. Yes, Mary, it is. Used to love you on radio, Kate, Dave and Husey. That was how we started um, Nova Melbourne in 20, 2001, um, me, Dave Hughes and Dave O'Neill. And, um, yes, it is amazing <laughs> that I've written a book. And it was funny because, um, hi, Vicky, hi, Louise. Oh, you're reading my book now. Oh, ask me something, Louise Brooks. Ask me immediately. Hello, Vivian. Um my husband, my eldest son, Lewis, um, was in the kitchen with me the other day and I just finished talking to Husey, who I had an 18-year on-air partnership with and who I love very much. And so much so that when I hung up, my son, Lewis, who's now 18, said, why did you stop working with Hugh, Mum? And I was holding my book at the time, which had just arrived, and I sort of held it 340 pages of it or whatever it is quite a few photos. I love photos. And I said to Lewis, because this is what two years of not working with Husey looks like. <laughs> it looks like a book for me. Fiona Henderson, tell us what inspired you to run away to Italy. That's a very good question from my editor, Fiona, who has strangely edited the whole book and yet doesn't know the answer to that question. <laughs> Um, we were at a point in our lives where um, our lives were great, rich, fun, but a little bit overburdened and in a way that I think a lot of people will, will relate to, um, that there was a lot of obligation, there was a lot of running around and... We just wanted a circuit breaker. And the first time we went to Italy, which was only in 2014 or 15, for the first time, we were struck by how time time is managed differently in Italy. And Italians take a different view of working and living. And we wanted a little bit of that. Alona, yes, I love the cover too. Thank you. Um, Felicity Tucker. I'm 136 pages in and enthralled. Oh, that's very beautiful. 
And Louise, do you still keep in touch with people you met Giovanni? Okay, this is a good question. So Giovanni is um, a recurring, well, there are many Giovannis in Italy, which will surprise nobody. But we had the good fortune in the way that you do when you're travelling and you take a risk to stumble across our Giovanni, the OG. Um, because when we when we moved to Italy and I was doing the radio show from there, our producer, our Hughes and Kate producer, had gone over before us um, and set up a little studio for me downtown in an office space. And when we were doing the show together the first two weeks to check that technically, because I'm not very technically proficient, as anyone who watched me try to set this up would know, um, Husey was always on at Sash about her romantic life, which was, if I may use a simile, like a parched desert. Yeah. Anyway, so he said to her, have you met any Italian men yet? And she said, no. And he said, you need to get on Tinder. And so she did. And so one morning we were doing the show and she was scrolling through her, this is a very interesting thing for women, that in Italy, her Tinder blew up. So overnight, she had like a hundred, over, well over a hundred guys interested. And Husey, of course, had a vision that Sash, who's like forty something, was going to hook up with a twenty-three-year-old guy, of which there were many. And she was like, "No, no." Scrolling through the guys, she held up her phone to me while I was on air with Husey and said, "What about this guy?" And he had a bike, a bitchy, and he just looked nice. He was into food. And the joke was, because my husband's a cyclist, that even if Sash didn't like him, my husband would get on very well with him. And so Sash went for a date with him. I think it's the second or third chapter of the book. I'm not going to ruin the ending, but suffice it to say it involves Italian sausage. (laughs) And it was a happy ending. And Giovanni became a really, really lovely friend of ours. And, yes, we are still in touch with him. And um, he messages us often when he's, particularly when he's in Sicily, which is where he loves to go from Bologna to ride his bike. And he rode um, there a lot with Peter and he introduced me to um, Armand Granitas. And we're in touch with nearly all of our Italian friends, depending on how much time we have, of course. Annabelle Pandiella. I loved your book, Kate. So inspirational. What Italian life lessons do you keep in your heart now? That's a great question because it's kind of a recurring, you know how you try and get into exercise and you go through those periods where you're like really activated and energised and I'm going to do something every day and I'm going to be so fit. People on the beach are going to think I'm like an Instagrammer. Maybe that's just me, but... The life lessons from Italy are kind of similar to that because they pertain to, for instance, the fact that it's evening now, it's Sera time, and I'm here wearing a T-shirt and overalls. In Italy, (laughs) I would be dressed up and about to do a passeggiata walking through the town on our way to dinner or coming home from aperitivo or cocktail hour, and... um, I would have put a break in my day and then be stepping into the evening looking beautiful. And it seems like um, that could almost be a shallow pursuit, but it's not. It's actually a really important part of community and um, not just the um, meeting people and the socialising, which you do, and all of Bologna is like a big village, really. I guess all of Italy is like a big village. Um but also that you you dress up and you make an effort, not for the people that you're going to meet necessarily, though it is for them, but also for yourself. So you kind of elevate yourself. As you can tell from my attire, that is um, a lesson that I keep coming back to. And also in the way that Italians will make everything lovely, um, even just for themselves eating at home or even if no one's looking. And that's a lesson that I I would like to, um, I don't know, finally learn. But like I said, I don't think 
most of life is a lesson that you learn and then you tick it off the list and then it's done. For me, like keeping my room tidy, it just seems to be a perennial and evergreen with um, leaves that that um, just keep giving. Vivian, Italy. Yes, Italy. Annie, love Italy and have been to Bologna. And you always make me laugh. I'm reading your book with your voice in mind. Some very touching moments and nice read. I'm nearly at the end, but I don't want to finish. Question, please. What visa did you get to be allowed to stay for a year? Oh, so my husband's just walked through the kitchen and just at the, come here, darling. This is, this was really Peter's um, field of expertise <laughs> because how many, this is Peter Allen Lewis, um, my oh. husband, alleged father of our children. So it was a very complicated, um, I think, pretty well doing anything bureaucratic in Italy is complicated. Mm -hmm. But there were so many visas, weren't there, to, yeah. to, and yet not one seemed to apply directly to us. Mm -hmm. So we weren't retirees and we had children and the children were going to go to school there, but we weren't tourists and I was going to work there but not get paid by Italy, get paid by Australia. So we were in a very um, unusual situation, mm -hmm. weren't we? Yeah. It was very molto difficile. That means very difficult. And then one day when we were at the um, Italian consulate and they were just so delightful to us because I think they couldn't believe what we were trying to do um, mm. and it kind of brought out the kindness in people, didn't it? Yeah, it Once they yeah, yeah. stopped laughing at us. Yeah. And um, Roberto, who was helping us at the consulate, just said, this is the visa for you. And when we kind of looked at it, we were a little bit, uncertain it didn't seem like it was 100 percent us and peter went he goes no no it's fine and peter goes can i get that in writing and he said no <laughs> <laughs> we were like oh okay mm. anyway we were there for two years not one year mm. and even though we had to do a lot of visa stuff over their fingerprints and we would go to the questura who are the citizenship police and even italians would do prayer hands when you're going off to the questura it was just a very complicated process always that yeah. Peter took charge of. We just started at the Melbourne consulate. We, we started here in Australia and it took uh, a couple of months. Yeah, a couple of, couple of months. Yeah. A couple of months, yeah. a lot of paperwork, yeah. marriage certificates and birth certificates. Mm. And then like you'd had to get. The residency that we seem to get, wasn't it? I don't know. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah, we wanted, we needed residency, but we had to have a. Um, we had to have a lease before we could get our visa mm. approved and then sure. just before we left, our apartment fell through, which is also we gather a very standard Italian thing because they have long leases and we only wanted a lease for a year, which automatically mm. made the landlord who was older just think, who are these weirdos? So we had an intense kind of mm. period then. But uh, I, I think... These things are always going to be intense anyway, and we just kept going. Our motto was we'll keep going till we see the wrong way turn back sign. And even COVID didn't hold that sign up to us. We were pretty determined. Thank you, darling. Do you want to answer a question? Uh, I can. Uh, that's not Emily a says, hello, Go Peter. Ahead. I say, hi, Emily. Yeah, that's lovely. <laughs> oh, everyone's saying hello, Peter. Oh, hello, Mary. Kylie, hi, Kate. What made you want to be a writer? That's a question. Um, well, I, I don't really think of myself as a writer, though I have worked as a writer quite extensively, but not in book form. So I have written for newspapers. I've written columns. I was a TV writer. Um, I've written sitcoms. So, and I've done, you know, a bit of editing of friends' scripts, but I never really thought that I would write a book because of the solitary nature of it. And people who might know my work from showbiz <clears throat> would know that I normally work in a highly collaborative nature, which is I like the engagement with other people. So the, the solitary, um, the climbing of the stairs... <laughs> It's literal, but it also took on a metaphorical aspect to me that I was like, because um, I started writing the book, obviously, in Italy, 
when I would climb the stairs to our little, we had a little a kind of tiny loft room that my husband had ticked the mattress on the side. It was supposed to be for guests, but obviously in 2020 we weren't getting guests. So he tipped the mattress on the side and set me up a little table. And when I would walk up the stairs to go take my place at the desk, I was reminded of those mistreating those mistreated donkeys that you see on Greek islands that are waiting at the dock for the large American tourists to arrive so that they can they can carry them up whatever, you know, mountainside they're at. And there's always kind of a grumpy man, you know, with a stick. I didn't have the grumpy man with a stick. I had my lovely editor, Fiona, and my husband. He doesn't have a stick. But still, I was, I was a reluctant, I was a burro, a reluctant mule-like creature. But... Whoever said, I hate writing, but I love having written, I should know who that was because it's a very wise thing to say, um, probably summed up my experience with it because it was a, the stories that I tell in my book are the stories that meant a lot to us and, and our family. And so there was a certain joy in recounting them. Um. Thank you, Joanne Shepherd Lemier. I'm not quite sure what happens here. Do you, you you don't just want to hear comments, do you? You want to hear questions that people have asked. Um, Karen, buying it tomorrow sounds great. Summer read. Hi again. What influenced you to begin writing the book? I think I've kind of answered that. Um, or have I? It was really that. Sometimes you're part of an era or you're living something and you don't really know that you're doing something amazing. You know, um, for instance, when I started on television doing the panel, which was in the 90s, and it was a very, um, it was a seminal show. No one had done a show like that in Australia. But we weren't thinking that at the time. I was just kind of in the slipstream of the working dog guys who were brilliant and enjoying it, but not thinking, oh, this is going to be a, something of significance. But there was something about our trip to Italy and the experience of living in Italy that I knew meant a lot, even as we were absorbed in every moment. And I tried not to be too, um, I tried not to be too, observant of every moment I don't know there's probably a term for that but where you're so conscious of watching yourself you don't you ever really lose a sense of yourself like people who are self-conscious on the dance floor I tried not to be like that to the point where I wouldn't even post for instance a photo on Instagram I would never take a photo for Instagram I only took photos that I wanted to take for our family or things that I loved and then I would always wait a few days or a week and then I would go oh Maybe I'll post that photo and share that. So it was a very, um, it was an undeniably um, rich and important experience for our family and for me individually and for my husband, for us as a unit. And I think it was also quite important for Italy. <laughs> that they had this family of six living in their quite sort of sedate um, town and they were very kind to us. Hello, Jennifer. Um, hi, Kate. Saving your book to enjoy during your long the long summer days ahead. You're very good. I can't save things when I like them. I just have to get into them as a half-eaten donut in the kitchen would, would attest. How wonderful to actually live your dream. Such precious memories made together as a family. Very true. It um, is unusual to have a dream like that and to realise it. And particularly in my life, there were probably more reasons to not go to Italy than there were to go. And by that I mean um, my job, which was a 
magnificent job with a team that I loved and that I'd worked with for a long time. Um, and my mother and father, who were really shady about the thought of us moving away. Um, interestingly, though, they both um, migrants, my parents, my dad's Dutch and my mum's Jamaican-American, and they had both moved away from their parents in the 60s and came to Australia. And then we saw them again three times in our life. So I had to say to my dad at one point, who was like a master, um, a brilliant master emotional manipulator, because he would just do it with love and making you really love him. <laughs> like not in a, you know, not in a way that would make you know that you were being played, even though you did realize it I said to dad one day you can't I pointed out to him the hypocrisy of him not wanting us to have a year when he had lived away from his parents for 40 years and after that he kind of got on board and then he came and visited us in Bologna him and mum which was just beautiful um thank you for your answer it is amazing that when you are so overwhelmed by emotion and experience, you're able to take the time to put it down in words and share it with the world. Thank you. I think because a lot of my work, um, I'm particularly the radio, has always been very personal, that sharing, even though it was different to do it in print, and I did say to my editor, Faye, when I actually saw the book for the first time, far from that elation that a lot of authors talk about, I didn't have that. I kind of had a, oh, my God, now people are going to read this, which is really strange because I talk about my life every day on the radio, operating on the principle, as Jude Lucy, the brilliant comedian, once said um, in a show, when I hear famous people, when I hear celebrities say they don't talk about their private lives, I always think, why not? And it's true. I've never subscribed to the extremely arrogant notion that there's anything happening in my life that's terribly different from what's happening in other people's lives. And I mean that in the broader sense of love and loss and hurt and betrayal and elation and, you know. So, and I've always found that a very um, rich and unifying common ground. Um, so to share the stories in my book was kind of an extension of that, but it did give me a bit of a shock to see it in print, which is unusual because on the radio, you know, um, I, I don't feel that same sense, but I think that's because on the radio you're immersed or I am immersed in the moment and afterwards it's kind of evaporated. But a book is not just for Christmas. <laughs> a book is for a lifetime, apparently. Migrant parents do what I say, not what I do. Annabelle, that is so true. Spot on. Hi, Kate. This is Shaz Helen. Hi, Kate. How did your kids find their experience at school in Italy? So the children went to, and this was partly the reason that we decided on Bologna, which is in the north of Italy. Um, initially, when we had decided that we were going to go, we thought that we might send the kids, or particularly the two younger ones, to a local school. Our plan, obviously, was that they would learn to speak Italian there much quicker and it would be immersive but then one day Peter and I were talking and we went, oh, that's actually quite cruel because we're not doing that to ourselves and they were already uprooting or being uprooted and everything was going to be new to them. The language would predominantly be, the spoken around them would be totally foreign to them. So then we opted for an international school. That's why we settled on Bologna. We went and looked at three international schools. It's the only time, and my Peter said at one point, are we travelling halfway around the world to send our kids to a private school? It's very anti-private school because we both, on both sides of our um, family, we have state school teachers. My dad, my 
mother-in-law Marie, um, my Peter's brother Mark. But anyway, lots of school teachers. But we went to Florence, too crowded. Went to Verona, too unfriendly. Poor Romeo and Juliet. And then we went to Bologna and it was like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. It was just right. Um, and the children actually really enjoyed their time at the school, which was truly an international school with, I don't know, 15 nationalities, a lot of Italians, surprisingly, who often had um, a mixed marriage and would want the kids to learn to speak English. Um and then the younger children, Adi and Yani, who were nine and 11, played basketball with local teams. And that really added another dimension to our life there. Um, some of it really annoying because it meant six basketball trainings a week at different times and tournaments on weekends. But it also meant we travelled around Italy and we met Italians outside of the, you know, the uh, international school and they became really beautiful friends of ours and the boys now speak Italian fluently. But there were times when I would see them. I remember vividly sitting watching Art, um, my number three, on a, I was sitting with the parents watching him and he was on the bench with his teammates and he was, I think I say, he was sitting there like an unread book and there was a cluster of teammates there and a couple next to him and he was just on his own and he couldn't understand them. And I did have a little pang of what have I done? This is too difficult. But then I thought people do difficult things all the time. I mean, I'm about to walk home on an empty stomach. So, you know, he learnt to, he learnt to tough it out. And I don't think they really fully appreciate the benefits of it yet. I think that may be one of those things that you might not appreciate until you're an adult, if at all. And if they don't, then it's a problem for their psychiatrist <laughs> or when they write their book, Mommy Dearest. Now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. let me scroll down. And did you have to readjust Lisa? Lisa, liquid gold. Beautiful. Did you have to readjust to Australia on return? Yes. Yes. Yes, I did. We did. Um, some of it came just so naturally and there were some things that were... Um, really joyful and a reminder of how predominantly we, for all we like to, you know, um, find fault with Australia. And it does seem to be a real prevalent mood in Australia when we returned. I was struck by um, how critical we are of ourselves, very critical of ourselves. And yet, there's so many fabulous things about us, not just the country, not just the geography and not just the infrastructure, not the fact that we have rubbish collections and, you know, gutters on the streets and we generally can live in safety and, and relative um, wealth and that we've got a great healthcare system, which Italy also has. But there seems to be... Um, a real hardness about ourselves and an anger in Australians. And that really shocked me how angry we are because, you know, you have these tropes about yourself as a culture and one of those is, you know, that we're easygoing but we're actually very angry people. And you know how I know that? <laughs> because when we were in Italy where people are generally not angry but they're very dramatic and they might be loud and they might be demonstrative, but they're not angry. I knew that Australians had this great quick to anger in them because I had it. I had it. 
was just I recognized it in myself. And once I recognized it, I kind of let it go because it's like who likes an angry person? And um, when we came back, I was shocked and I still am shocked on the roads at how angry people are, horns blaring and I mean, I have to assume it's not my driving because I don't think I drove any better in Australia than I did in Italy and people just seemed to kind of go with the flow. But that was interesting. But there were so many things that were just fantastic, our sports facilities for kids, many of which are like almost third worldish in Italy. Like the boys would play sometimes, we'd go to a town and play basketball, basketball and the arena would be like one of those inflatable tents like a temporary structure. Most of their infrastructure is really, really old. Whereas in America, in Australia, we um, we have like world-class facilities. And as I said, the rubbish collection, which is just, we didn't have that in Italy. Little things to be grateful for. The fact that I could go outside and hop in a car and drive somewhere and not have some complicated scenario about going to a parking garage 500 metres away and blah, 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 and waiting for the guys to get my car out, those things. And, you know, as they say, God is in the details. And we also had to find things that we loved about Australia because we had to fall back in love with Australia because we'd had an affair on Australia. (laughs) Kate O'Brien, were there any anecdotes or stories that you had to omit in the editing process? Um, Well, when I wrote the book, I wrote moments and stories and um, events that were of significance to us and to me to me really, or to others through, you know, the prism of me as their mother or wife watching them. But I don't think we really had to edit anything out. Um, We did discuss whether or not to change names and I had asked all the Italians that I was going to write about while we were there, do you want me to change your name and the Italians are a very a remarkably open people and so they were like why would you change my name and my landlord Ferdy would keep saying to me you are an artist I'm not telling an artist what to do for instance speaking of Italians being very open when uh, we were setting up a bank account which took a week In fact, probably two weeks, but it took a week to open a bank account. Um, The lovely woman at the bank who helped us, who was so sweet, told us how much she got paid. She got paid 38,000 euros a year. She'd worked at the bank for like 19 years. Now, I have never once encountered... I haven't spent a lot of time in banks, but I just can't imagine an Australian doing that. Like just she was just very, you know, and then she was telling us how much tax she paid and just making chit chat. <laughs> and I guess it was kind of appropriate because we were in a bank and they're about money. But it was still it was still so refreshing. Um So most, really, we didn't even end up changing anybody's names. I think I changed a couple of people's names. Um, And one of those was just because I didn't want to give them the gratification of seeing their name in print. (laughs) Isn't that terrible? Um, They didn't deserve it. And um, the other was just because it was, you know, maybe not nice for them. There were stories that I would tell sometimes about the children where I would be like, this is, um, you want to walk the line of not breaching that kind of trust between a parent and a child. But at the same time, they were stories that were my stories as they affected me. 
So because I've, you know, I just kind of felt okay to tell them. And also I felt quite safe in the knowledge that none of my children would ever read the book. <laughs> the little ones are readers. The two older teenagers, not so much. Although my daughter did read the book and, in fact, loved it. Hmm. Why do you think we're so angry, not enough joy in everyday life? Mm. Well, this is like a big, it's kind of a big answer. Well, it's a big question. One of the things that I noticed living in Italy was, and I kind of referred to this, I alluded to this before, but maybe I didn't explain it very well, but how you are always surrounded by beauty. And they're not like, we were there when the Black Lives Matter movement was happening in the States. Initially, they're not knocking over statues. They have a different, they have a different view of the world. Do you know what I mean? Their issues are different, but they could have, everyone's had a crack at Italy. You know, they, there's certainly no reason for them not to be um, wanting to knock over some statues for sure. But wherever we went, things were beautiful on a micro level and a macro level. For instance, we lived in a medieval town in which there were hundreds of ancient buildings and we would say quite often, how did they know not to knock down their old buildings? In Australia, if you're a house from the 1950s it's curtains for you 1960s 1970s 19 like it, we just don't have that um respect or the longevity of vision to realize that what is new now in italy what was new in the 1200s they knew would one day ah, in 2019 someone's gonna like this building we lived in a when we moved into our palazzo apartment, which was a um, palace, an Italian palace, not a French palace, but it was still very grand and beautiful, but it had been divided into a lot of apartments. Our balcony was from the 1500s. Things like that are astounding to me. And I do think that kind of transience and that keep the churn that we have in Australia. We're always changing the names of things and one week it's Telstra Stadium, the next week it's Amy Stadium or whatever. There's just this constant, it's the VCE, no, it's not, it's the HSC and then you're a fool if you use the wrong name. Like oh. We just don't have that same groundedness and I think that our anger probably comes from a spiritual lack and I don't know where that nourishment comes from in Italy because no one seems to go to church maybe once a year but I think they still have that the family kind of keeps them together I don't know I don't know where the anger comes from but I saw it in, I saw it in myself and just went oh well that's not helpful and when I came back to Australia you know and there were issues coming on that are coming on the scene that of course um of course, had people angry and upset, a lot of them pertaining to women. But everyone was like, we need to be angry about this, we need to be angry. And I'm like, eh, maybe there's a different way to go. You know, the Italians find a different way to go sometimes. And that's just that thinking, not that it's, you know, you can't kind of change essentially who you are or how you feel about things. But, gee, sometimes it's nice just to do the old, eh, Eh, you know, I don't know. We had a lovely exchange, Italian exchange student. Hello, Tara Trigg, La Covella. Lived with us for almost a year. It seemed to us Italian kids grow up faster than Aussie kids. Did you see that in Italy? Um, I wouldn't say grow up. But they certainly have a level of independence that um, we don't extend broadly to our children at the same age. But maybe it's also because um, 
the children that we were living in a very, very safe town. Not not all of it, obviously. It's, it wasn't, you know, a paradise, but the children could walk around. They could go to the piazza at night. My daughter could walk home from art uh, lessons at 8 o'clock at night, whereas in our suburb in Melbourne, we would not be comfortable letting the children do that. So um, the other thing that was very interesting is the culture of drinking that doesn't seem to have the same um, ravenous thirst that Australians have. So that the Italians, even the children, obviously, you know, at their parties, they'd, they'd, you know, some of them would get drunk or whatever, but it was very much the exception. We never really saw many of our Italian friends drunk at all. I have to say they saw us drunk. Didn't they, Peter? <laughs> My husband flew the flag for that a couple of times, you know, um, but there's a moderation in drinking in Italy which is quite surprising given that wine is everywhere. For instance, at the, it would always make us laugh that we'd on the autostrada, so on the freeway, you'd pull into a service station and there would be a bar there, like a separate bar, because, of course, that's what you need when you're flying along a freeway at 160 kilometres an hour is to go in somewhere and, ah, I need a glass of wine, <laughs> take the edge off my driving. So even though alcohol is really readily and freely available, it's a, you can buy it at the 7-Eleven, you can buy it, of course, in, you know, um, coffee shops that are open in the morning. You could go in there and get lick it up if you wanted at, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning. But the children... And, and the teenagers didn't have the same drinking culture and the adults didn't. And I think maybe that means that you're extended more independence. Certainly we gave that to my eldest son who we let go to um, Eastern Europe over the first Easter. We were there on his own for five days with one of his mates from school, which my parents were very unhappy about. And so was Husey at the time. But we were like, hmm. Aren't we here to have an adventure? Hmm, let me try and scroll down. Hang on. Kathy, hello, Kathy. Um, love your honesty. Well, that's all we've got, really, isn't it? I mean, um, I'm trying to look at for another question. Do I read comments or is that just weird? Or do we wrap now? Maybe we wrap. Oh, yeah, we wrap. We're done. What do you think? Um, oh, Felicity, we did the Berlin and Prague version for four and a half years as a family of six and spent loads of time in Italy. There really is nowhere like it. Yeah, we had friends who were living in Berlin, Australians, and they came and visited us and even though they were really enjoying um, living in Berlin, it didn't sound um, it didn't sound like a place that I would want to live. Great to party, apparently. Um, that's it from me. Um, thank you for joining me tonight. Um, I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question. Um, but you can also Instagram me if you want. I, it's my name, Kate Langbrook, on Instagram and also on Twitter. Um, and you can read more about our family adventures in Chow Bella or you can listen to it on the audio book where um, some of the words I was saying out loud, obviously, for the first time and it made me cry. But it also made me laugh. And what else is there? Um, I wish you all a Merry Christmas with hopefully more laughter than tears. And if they are tears, then tears of joy at us getting to celebrate and be festive and spend time with people we love. And as we like to say, um, champagne for my real friends.
real pain for my sham friends. <laughs> no, no, ci vediamo. <laughs>